Good morning. So, so quick story. I found out that Ray's a big Manchester United fan, and uh, I recently became one, so I, I had to give him the honor of giving him the scarf. Uh, I'm James Feger. I'm the, uh, the head of network virtualization for CenturyLink. And this morning, what I'd like to talk about is a little bit around the transformation that's occurring inside of the network and the impact on operations associated with that. Um, prior to, to my current role, I've actually done some operational time inside of CenturyLink. I was part of the global operations team. Uh, in addition to that, I actually ran our IT operations uh, organization for a while as well. So I'm coming at this from a, uh, from a practical perspective as well. A little bit about CenturyLink. Uh, we recently uh, closed our acquisition of Level 3. So th these are the statistics of the new combined company. Um, I'm not going to read through all of those. Hopefully all of you can see that quite well. But, but roughly, you know, it's a, it's a 50,000 employee global company. Um, we operate in 60 plus countries. And we have about 100,000 buildings on net on our fiber network. So I want to look at a, a traditional view of operations. I mean, how, how many people here are part of an operations organization or have been part of an operations organization? A couple. How many people are in the network design world and have never done anything in operations? A couple. All right. Yeah. Thank you for being honest. So operations is, is really viewed as the guardians of the network. Their job is to keep things up, keep the lights on, and keep the customers happy. Usually they've been traditionally organized by technology. So you, know, you have a transport team, your IP, or you know, IP and Ethernet teams. You have the operating system uh, folks. You have application developers and, and uh, operations teams. And they've been, they've been supported by what I call the big systems. Right. Again, talking traditional here. So, you know, the ticketing system, the alarm browser, the inventory system. Right? Is that, is that kind of reading the operations people? Any nods? Right. Yeah. So um, the reality is, is that's not true. <laughs> there we go. The reality is, is that there are multiple systems. Um, there's multiple alarm systems. There's the whole uh, swivel chair. I'm sure people have heard of the term swivel chair. Um, multiple provisioning systems. There's always this special configuration tool. There's a special inventory tool for the things that, hey, we need to get to market quickly, and then, um, then we'll build the systems. Then we'll build the automation. As a result, the operations teams have become quite skilled at working around the things that the technology teams have dropped into their laps. Uh, so they build their own tools, you know, the whole concept of shadow IT and shadow ops. They changed the processes. So when I went over to uh, the operations team, so I started in technology. Actually, I started in operations. I worked in a NOC at a tier one carrier. And then I went into engineering architecture in the CTO organization. And then, again, recently I went back into operations. And now I'm back into development, uh, all planned. And, and it's given me a different perspective. And what I found was the tools uh, that we developed weren't being used the way we had meant for them to be developed. And the tools that the operations teams built got the job done, but didn't really account for the larger, uh, the larger aspects and impacts. Um, and so again, um, what this resulted in is operations working harder and probably not as efficiently as they could to serve the customer. So let, let's take a look at what's ahead. What's, what's changing in our environment? What's, and, and what's the impact going to be on operations? So now we understand the perspective of ops, the reality of ops, and what's changing in our industry? So, so who's people sitting in these rooms? I'm sure we've heard, you know, we just heard about SDN and NFE. We've heard a lot about containers. We've heard a lot about open source. Um, by the way, all things that are disruptive to operations. And, and where I've also heard a little bit about Internet of Things, right? So we've talked about Internet of Things now for a while. Uh, but, but it's real. And we need, to, we need to classify and quantify what that really means to us. Sorry, I went too fast for somebody taking a picture. Um, so, so this data, and, and by the way, if you've sat here, you've kind of heard uh, throughout the day, these numbers are uh, definitely disputable, uh, but I think they're pretty accurate. We're, I, I heard some numbers yesterday that said something like, uh, you know, 20 billion devices connected and you know, 4 billion uh, intelligent systems or vice versa. And it doesn't matter when you're talking about 1 billion, 2 billion, 5 billion. It's, just, it's a lot more than what we are dealing with today. So what are some of the things that are driving that? Um, we see some of this now. Robotics, drones, automation. These are real things, right? We have this today. 
A lot of this is, is being used in industrial environments. Uh, we've, we've seen, I think there's a video somewhere I saw with the, uh, with the shipping container trackers and uh, you know, railroad yard inspections. Um, and if you think about the benefits to these things, it's efficiency, safety. You know, flying a drone between trains is much better than having people out there walking around uh, risking their lives. And then the interactions of, of robotics and humans. We've had that for a long time, right? The robotic surgeries and you know, robotics and auto manufacturing. But coupled on top of that, we're now starting to see this real large proliferation and acceleration behind machine learning and big data. Now we've been talking about this for a long time, but now we can understand the realities of this, the impacts of this. We saw uh, Phil give his presentation this morning talking about how Spectrum is using some of this data for customer experience changes. I think everybody in the industry is looking at it that way. I know we definitely are. I know a lot of my peers are. And then lastly, the thing I really want to focus on here is the virtualization aspect. So, so the SDN and NFE, and um, uh, I think yesterday I heard the term uh, containerized uh, network functions or containerized functions. So we'll, I guess I need to come up with, what is this, containerized? Instead of VNFs, CNFs, right? So cloud native, yep, yep. So I love audience participation, <laughs> truly. So what do we do with this opportunity? So now what we're looking at is we're changing the infrastructure of the network. So we have, we have an ops team that's pretty skilled at adapting to change. We have uh, a lot of change coming with all of these devices. We have a lot of change coming with the capabilities that we have with the analytics. And we have what I consider to be a, a monumental change in actually how we can tool ourselves uh, with the change of the infrastructure. So traditionally, we've dropped boxes in, box here, box there, management systems, ticketing systems. But we haven't really changed the environment. What we did was we would look at IT projects to consolidate systems, consolidate tools, bring together the operational systems and the back-end systems. And maybe we have migrations of alarms. But we didn't do anything to the infrastructure. Now's the time where we have an opportunity because we're fundamentally changing the infrastructure an infra to an infrastructure that has a lot more capability. So we should harness the power of this disruption, right? Take advantage of it. It's not just dropping in new boxes. It's not just decoupling operating systems from white box merchant silicon. It's a fundamental shift in how we can approach designing the network telemetry. So the way I see this is changing the infrastructure can become the catalyst for changing the backend systems and changing the tooling. You must build telemetry into this new design. Don't make it an afterthought. With virtualization, we have now more points of insertion and presence and, and visibility into these pods and these racks and stacks than we've ever had before. Um, the big systems efforts that I know many, many companies go through, the, you know, the inventory. How many people have been part of an inventory consolidation project? A couple, yeah, yeah. Still alive though, right? That's something to look forward to. Um, <laughs> Those are hard. Those are really, really hard. And then, by the way, how many of you are confident that those records were actually all accurate? Probably not a lot, right? So um, take advantage of killing off these big systems projects by leveraging the new infrastructure. It's a shift. Um, and then learn from the homegrown tools. So again, operations came up with shadow IT and shadow ops. They didn't do that because they were bored. They did that because they had a need that wasn't being served. So, with that need, understand what that driver was and build this into the new infrastructure, into the new tools. The magic picture. I see my buddy Prayson taking a picture here. So I stole this picture. I stole one of the pictures from him. So um, reduce the complexity of the environment that operations is involved in, right? So, so everybody's seen the picture. Actually, in the last presentation, we had a, a similar picture. We had the person sitting in front of thousands of cables. This is real stuff. I mean, this is a real environment. I, all, the, all the pictures, all marketing pictures where everything's tucked away and clean and pretty, maybe, sure. Um, this is real stuff. And by eliminating the cables, by eliminating the cross connects, by giving the flexibility to actually virtually move services, by stacking all of these different functions onto a common platform, is, is I think, being underestimated in terms of the capabilities it's going to give us operationally. So I kind of talked about this a little bit, but it's, it's a matter of launching the tools with automation at the base. Develop the APIs into the operating system. Develop the APIs into the hardware. Um, 
I made a comment yesterday on one of the panels that I was part of that it's, it's actually a shame as an industry that the, the chips that run our current networks have had telemetry data in them that hasn't traditionally been totally exposed to us by our suppliers. That's changing. Now we have better telemetry, but a lot of the products that we're seeing coming out of, out of our commercial vendors are based on the fact they're now exposing this telemetry. So, you know, I have to, I'm a conspiracy person, so I gotta wonder if that was intentional or not. I'd like to think that's not the case. Um, and then take advantage of the stuff that exists. So when we look at uh, the things that are available commercially and in the open source community, it's not an either or discussion, it's, it's both. I think the answer's always been both, and people just have to get comfortable with that. And then uh, lastly, uh, automated performance management, service assurance, telemetry as a whole gives the operations teams the confidence that they need to understand what's going on in the network and make decisions where the machines haven't necessarily caught up. Spend the time tooling and retooling the AI machine. Well, I got ahead of myself. Don't, let sof don't be afraid to let software make the decisions for you. So, uh, another, another example that I, I kind of ran into, this was on a simple, um, I was actually talking to a customer, and uh, this customer had a, a fairly robust uh, security platform, and the security platform had all of the data it needed to actually stop and shut down systems if it saw malicious traffic on their network. It's pretty, pretty basic, right? There's sniffing sniff packets, peacetime learning versus what they see now, and they can make a decision. They weren't doing that. They, they collected everything, they analyzed everything. They actually had a, a percentage of accuracy, and I think, it was a, I think it was above something like 85%, which, you know, it's only 85%, but that's pretty good. And then what they did was they generated an email um, to the operations team, because the operations team wanted to make sure that that port should be disabled before, before something happened. And, um, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not bashing this customer here. I, I think that's probably the case for a lot of operational environments because we need to make sure we need to check. Well, by the time you checked, some damage has already been done. So now they're actually doing it automatically and they haven't had data center failures. So um, it, it's, a, it's a cultural shift, but I think it's an important one to think about is trust the data, trust the machine. Now you have to spend time tuning it. You have to make sure it's right up front. It's just like, you know, Make sure you plan for your project. It's make sure you plan for how the machine's going to respond. And, and through the automation, I think the, the other thing that's, that's really important to understand here is um, automation allows you to put your best people on your toughest problems. So again, uh, this customer is, is the example. Uh, when I was speaking with them, they'd get the alert, and then the email would be fired off, and it would go to their advanced, advanced tax center and uh, advanced TAC, I guess TAC center is uh, redundant, but uh, that, was the, that, was the, that was essentially the top echelon of their operations folks. So now you have top echelon people reviewing a decision that a machine had made, and by the way, had been making for something like nine months accurately, and they're, they're now pulled off of whatever they're working on, and they're, they're looking at this and kind of studying, and yep, that's right, that data's correct, and they'd hit the button. So, so you're, you're losing productivity with your top people when you're not trusting the automation. So I want to talk a little bit about a practical example of where we have taken advantage of the change in the network and building automation into the stack and the result that that had on, on us. Um, so when you talk about deploying a virtual network environment or a, net, you know, a virtual pod, a cloud pod, whatever you want to call it, um, it's very complex. And uh, part of the driver for this, this example here is, is my ops counterpart uh, told me, if I have to hire a bunch of PhDs to run this environment, James, you're building it wrong. I said, Ron, that's fair. That's a fair, that's a fair point. Um, and so we stepped back and looked at this and said, wow, it really is complex. You have multiple vendors. You have different components. You have servers, white box switches, operating systems. You can purchase operating systems. You can build your own operating systems. In our case, we've, we've built our own operating system. And we, we also use uh, uh, commercially available operating systems. Um, you have different models within those operating systems. APIs, right? APIs are standard. How many different API platforms are there? I think there was a comment last night um, I heard at, at dinner that Somebody said the concern actually on some of these API platform companies is that each of their customers has a different implementation and a different approach to APIs. And so the companies that have been founded on the idea of 
helping standardize this are now actually looking at crisscrossing APIs because they have to support all of these different requests. Um, and then creating, a, creating a, a, a service has to have multiple views, not only within the racks or within the data center, but across the network, right? So you may have customers that are being served virtually in one location and still being served traditionally in another location. And I think I made this comment yesterday as well. Um, and, and you know, this is a broad stroke. I don't mean to offend anybody. But in my experience, and, and I have software development teams, I have hardware development teams, and I have, have network engineers and architects. My, I myself, I am a network guy by, by uh, background. Um, we are not, network people, in my opinion, aren't necessarily programmers. Now, we can script, we can write stuff, we can understand it, we can hack things together, and heck, we might even build, be able to build some cool apps. But traditionally, in a pool, programmers and network people have a fundamental different view in how their brain operates. It's just, just been my experience. Um, by the way, not bad. I think it's really good, because when I bring the two groups together, amazingly cool things happen, like this. So we created something called Victor. Um, a colleague of mine uh, named it, and I haven't really gotten the, I mean, he kind of backed in some letters, but, but anyway. What Victor is, is a, uh, um, it's a microservice. It's an orchestration platform, and it's a graph-based design tool that supports automatic UI generation for the graph, automatic web service calls, and, and, and in our first drop, we're on like release 0 0.2 or something right now. Uh, we, we have service chaining built in. And it's a mix and match of, of capabilities. So it can speak you know, web services, it can speak Ansible, it can speak NetComp Yang. Uh, I think we, we actually sort of joked, um, again, programmers versus network people. Um, somebody mentioned, do we, can we do TL1? Um, and uh, I can't remember which group it was. There was weird cross eyes. It was, it was kind of like a dance off. It was a little scary. Um, but we don't do TL1 today, and maybe we will. The idea here is, is that you can log in, and if you can build a flow chart in PowerPoint or Visio, you can orchestrate a service. So all of the graphs that you see down in the bottom under service designer, all of the blocks are dynamically generated based on what the tool has abstracted from the control pod and from the VNF factory. We can then assign network, we can assign resources, and then as we create that service from a flow perspective, it generates a dynamic web services URL uh, or API uh, based on that flow so it can be reused from a microservice perspective. The result of that is um, we're able to deploy you know, hundreds of cores into a location, into a rack, new, new deployment within two days. And that includes, by the way, the rack and stack. So the, 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 before we automated it, so again, going back to build this into the, the capabilities, we, we built all of the capabilities into the stack. We built it into Victor, we built it into the operating system, we built it into the OpenStack environment that we have, and the first turn up that we did, this is in December, so this is all fairly recent data, was manual. We did it manually on purpose to make sure that we, we documented the flow, document what the flow, flow chart should look like. And that honestly took us probably about a week and a half. We had some issues, cabling issues, other goofy stuff, but about a week and a half. And the next deployment, uh, which was about two weeks later, uh, we cut that down to, I think it was four days. And then the last deployment that we did uh, was last month, we cut it down to two days. And that included all the bacon time. So, so we spun up and tore down something like 3,000 VMs. It was throttled, we could have gone faster, but the team was very nervous. And uh, again, talking about developers and programmers and how excited they are about this stuff, there was, on, on, on the first drop, the first release, it was 0 0.1 release, there was a 1% um, failure rate on the teardown of the VM. So they spun up 3,000 and tore down 3,000, but with a 1% failure rate. So 30, 30 did not stop working. The, the network ports were straddled, stranded. And these, this team was devastated. <laughs> like, they, they're like, oh, you know, it's a 1% failure rate. We, 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 didn't get, we didn't hit the mark like we wanted. I looked at them and said, do you realize that you just automated something, that you cut days out of this? So I, we can deal with not turning something off, right? We can figure that out. Now that's fixed. They found the bug, and, uh, and we're good. Um, but another mentality approach here is, is the person that was upset about that was um, somebody said, if I have more than one line of code, I can find a defect. 
So think about that for a minute. When you think about operational excellence, you think about the improvements that you're trying to target, this person's brain says if there's more than one line of code, I can find an efficiency improvement or a defect. So that's Victor, and I'm running out of time, so I want to, to kind of close here for you all is, um, you know, in summary, the views that, that we have is, is operations is a very complex environment, and ops has become highly skilled at adapting to this changing environment. Um, monolithic tooling has assisted in creating this, in, this complex environment, the swivel chairs, the multiple inventory systems, multiple ticketing systems. Um, but now we have the opportunity to actually build this stuff into the platforms, take advantage of the shift that's occurring, and again, put your best people on your toughest problems, and that's gonna result in an overall better customer experience. So thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. Great insight into what's really going on in the engine room yeah. uh, behind CenturyLink. Just a very quick one, because I know there's a van waiting outside <laughs> with the engine already running to yeah. take you to Dallas. Um, in terms of the potential for automation of processes, are you starting at a, at a very kind of simple level, or only finding the things you know already work and starting to automate those, or are you kind of... Yeah, yeah exactly. So, we, so in the traditional network, we've gotten pretty good. I think, I think most, most telcos have probably gotten pretty good at it automating, whether it's through the shadow ops, shadow IT teams, or through the big systems teams of automating what we do well, right? I mean, you know, MPLS circuits and transport circuits and IP backbone circuits and managed services, all that stuff's had some automation associated with it. And so for us, the way we look at it is, is okay, what's the basic things that we need to get going without taking ops backwards? Right. So make sure those are baked in to start. And, and that way, when you, when you start pivoting services over to the virtual environment, it's a comfort zone for the team. They're like, well, I know I have this data over here on this, this router and I have that data over here now on this virtual pod. Um, it, it's a comfort zone thing from a culture standpoint. Okay, excellent. Well, good luck getting to Dallas. Thank you, appreciate it. Thanks for the scarf. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Don't, don't forget to take it for your next <laughs> visit to Old Trafford. <laughs> All right, Ladies and gentlemen, James Thank Fager you. from CenturyLink. Thank you.